Good morning, Steam Power Plants class. This is Wednesday, the 22nd. And uh, about time I uh, get moving here and I need to kill that video. Oh my goodness, what in the world? How do I do this? Oh, crud. Stop video there. Whew, that was awful. Sorry. Um, we're going to start um, our last uh, kind of block of the course here, which is on uh, principles of combustion. Uh, it says on the notes you see in front of you, chapter nine, that that's, uh, and these come out of the uh, STEAM book. Uh, they've changed. It's now chapter 10. Uh, but when I wrote the notes, it was chapter nine. So it's still chapter nine in the notes. Uh, I will send you a bunch of files. I'll send you the entire chapter 10. <coughs> um, you will be responsible only for what we cover uh, in the lecture. Uh, yeah, as you know by now, the um, uh, STEAM chapters are quite in depth with lots of detail and I'm not gonna hold you on the final exam, I'm not gonna hold you responsible for all of chapter 10. Uh, and by the way, we do have a quiz. The last of the STEAM chapter quizzes will be tomorrow uh, from 2 to 2.30 on the uh, uh, SOX, the uh, uh, sulfur uh, oxides, uh, mostly sulfur dioxide, but that, that chapter, what is that? I think it's 34 in the uh, STEAM book, but I'll put that in the uh, email to you. Okay, so let's get moving. We know that uh, combustion is about uh, oxidation. Uh, when the chemistry people talk about it, they probably talk uh, uh, oxidation. And for uh, a power plants guy, it's usually a fossil fuel. And the fossil fuels, when they burn, what are you burning? You're burning carbon, you're burning hydrogen, and you're burning sulfur. So that's primarily what we're uh, interested in here. Um, B and W, Babcock and Wilcox, uh, coined the three T's of combustion a long, long time ago. And these are requirements to have effective, uh, complete combustion. And it's time, temperature, and turbulence. Uh, the fuel uh, needs to be in a proper consistency too. So for example, a pulverized coal, the, the particle size has an impact on it. But <laughs> at any rate, if you're gonna burn pulverized coal, you have to bring it up to temperature uh, above the initiation of oxidation temperature, and you need to hold it there for a long enough time so that you can have complete uh, combustion. And you need turbulence with an, uh, an oxygen source, which is typically air, so that you have good mixing, so that you have oxygen molecules present where needed to uh, oxidize the hydrogen, uh, the carbon, and the sulfur. We'd rather the sulfur not be there, but it comes in the coal. And it actually has a heating value, as you will see, and it contributes to the heat release. It also contributes, obviously, to the, the uh, emissions uh, that we're concerned about. Uh, table one, I'll, uh, again, I will send you all of this, but I'm gonna switch over to uh, some figures out of the STEAM chapter. Well, that's just a site chart. Can't go anywhere without a psych chart, you know. Uh, this is table one, and this is there's a tremendous amount of good information here. Um, so you should keep this handout forever, <laughs> or it'll be in the chapter. It comes out of that chapter 10. Uh, but these are combustion constants, as you see in the title. Uh, and I'll note there uh, the footnotes down here at the bottom, which uh, are referred to up in the table at various locations. You probably need to, if you're going to use this table, you probably need to uh, read through all of these footnotes. I'm not going to read them all to you. Uh, you can do that. But so over here on the far left, we have whatever substance that uh, we have constants for. We start out with pretty, pretty simple stuff, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, uh, oxygen. And then there is this term atmospheric nitrogen. So nitrogen is elemental nitrogen N2. N2A is if we consider uh, a quantity of dry air, it's made up of 
you know, a number of gases, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, but there are trace gases, uh, CO2, the dreaded gas that we all talk about, uh, argon and other trace gases are there. Well, in engineering calculations, a lot of times it's the, the, the trace gases don't really have much of an impact because there's not much of them. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll just consider dry air to be oxygen and atmospheric nitrogen with all of the other gases rolled into the atmospheric nitrogen. And you can see from the molecular weight, it doesn't change very much. Uh, you know, argon is a heavier gas than uh, nitrogen. That's the primary gas. And I guess um, CO, um, it's also uh, heavy. Is that right? 18, yeah. 18, 20, yeah, slightly heavier. Um, well, now I guess it's uh, just about the same as nitrogen. You see the weights right there. But at any rate, the argon is heavier. And so that increases the weight average molecular weight of atmospheric nitrogen a little bit above that of nitrogen. So we will actually use this concept some in, in some for problems. And so this would be the correct uh, molecular weight, 28 point, I guess, uh, 1, 6 or 158, depending on how many digits you want to carry. Um, and you can look down through here, we've got all kinds of different uh, hydrocarbon gases that we can burn, the paraffin series, the olefin series, the aromatic series, if you remember all that from chemistry, which if I wasn't reading it, I probably wouldn't. Uh, Some miscellaneous gases here, sulfur, uh, molecular weight uh, 32, hydrogen sulfide, there's water vapor, and there's air down there on the bottom of the table. But so primarily this is looking at uh, combustion. So let's just look at carbon and hydrogen here for a second. Let's say uh, uh, there's a formula, molecular weight, and here's for a gaseous fuel, which most of them are, we get a density uh, pounds per cubic foot, and the conditions are given down in the footnotes. Or this is a specific volume, so it should be one over density of specific volume, and then specific gravity reference to that of standard air. Uh, so you see that information. Now we get over here to heats of combustion. Let's say we're going to burn some of this stuff. Well, how much are we going to burn? So in these, these two columns, <coughs> we have BTUs uh, that are released from uh, the combustion of a standard cubic foot. And so, well, we can't do carbon because it doesn't come per standard cubic foot. We have to do it per pound, so we'll get there in a second. So hydrogen, we see, and we have a gross and a net. <coughs> okay, so the difference here is called uh, the gross is the higher heating value, and the net is the lower heating value. It's the same uh, amount of hydrogen, which contains the same amount of energy, but when hydrogen burns, it burns to water vapor, and the, the difference between these co two columns is the state of the water vapor at the end of the test. To get the higher heating value or gross heating value, you have to condense the water vapor and so then the latent heat gets attributed to the fuel, and so you get a higher number, 324.2. If you allow the water vapor to stay in the vapor state and don't condense it, then it contains more energy, and that energy does not get attributed to the fuel, and so it looks like the hydrogen has produced less. That would be 273.9. So the difference in those is whether or not the water vapor condenses. If it does, then the number is bigger for the fuel. If it doesn't, the number is smaller for the fuel. Okay, uh, and then we can do these also, instead of on a cubic foot basis, we can do it per pound, uh, or you can do it in, uh, you know, per kilogram if you have a, a, a table that's prepared that way, or you can convert. So now we see that for burning carbon, it doesn't produce any water vapor, and so its net and gross heating values are the same because there's, there's nothing to condense. And so this would be the higher heating value, this would be the lower heating value. And so this, these numbers then per pound translate from these numbers per cubic foot. You don't get that much weight 
in a cubic, a standard cubic foot of hydrogen. Okay, uh, so this then would be uh, required for combustion. So this is this would be cubic foot of air or N2A or oxygen required for combustion. Um, and so uh, if we do this on a molar basis, on a volume basis is a molar basis. Um, and, and so we see that to burn say one mole of carbon, we need one mole of O2 to make one mole of CO2. Okay, and these are flue products. That's what goes up the flue. And then this is what's required for combustion. So we typically get the air from outside. And so to get one mole of oxygen, O2, we have to also bring in 3.773 moles of N2A, which is everything else, excluding water vapor, which we also get, but that's not included here. And so if you total these together, you have to bring in 4.773 moles of air to get your one mole of oxygen, and that also brings in the 3.773 moles of N2A. Uh, up the stack, you know, the, the, the one mole of carbon combines with the one mole of oxygen to give us one mole of CO2, and then we also have to pass the N2A up the stack. Okay, and we can look at the at the hydrogen, um, the formula for water is H2O, and so we're bringing in O2s, so we need only need a half of an O2 to balance this stoichiometrically. So for each one H2, we bring in a half of an O2, which means we have to bring in just half of the 3.77 for the N2A, and the 2.387 uh, is half of the 4.773. We, that combines, we get one mole of water, which could be vapor. And this is, if it's a flu product, I guess we're assuming it goes up in the vapor state. Uh, and then the N2A, okay? So then we can <clears throat> look over here at the, um, do it on a per pound basis. So to burn a pound, this top line is carbon we need to bring in 11.51 pounds of standard air. That would exclude any moisture in the air. And of that, uh, 2.664 pounds of that will be oxygen and the rest of it will be N2A, okay? And then this one, uh, uh, this one pound of carbon will produce 3.664 pounds of CO2 and then the rest that goes up the stack is the N2A. On the water, on the hydrogen, the one pound of hydrogen uh, requires this number of pounds of oxygen. And to get it, we need this number of pounds of N2A to come in also, and so that's our total air. And then of course, this is the water vapor <clears throat> produced uh, from the combustion of one pound of hydrogen, and then this is the N2A that goes back up the stack. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of information here. I use this table a good bit if I'm uh, dinking around with boilers. Um, major constituent of natural gas is methane, uh, between 85 and probably 95%, depending on the particular methane, and ethane is probably the next biggest uh, component. And so you see you've got uh, some numbers here for the combustion of those. Uh, let's see, we can look down, uh, down here. Uh, let's look at the sulfur. That's this line. Let's see how much, how many BTUs do we get? Uh, what do we get out of the, where's the heating value? Uh, I lost it. Okay, heat of combustion. So for every mole of sulfur, we get uh, almost 4,000. Uh, BTUs uh, of energy release. So it's not a great fuel, but uh, anyway. The other thing you can note between, uh, well, we'll get to that later. Okay. I think that's enough discussion of this. So let's leave that behind and go back to the notes now. Um, you know, some basic definitions uh, back to your chemistry. 
a mole. Um, the, and I don't have it written here, but you recall Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that's the number of um, particles or atoms, depends if you're talking about a, a compound or uh, an element. But let's say we're just talking about uh, carbon. So 6.22 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms of carbon in a gram mole. Okay, Avogadro's number directly applies only to gram moles because we can work in gram moles, kilogram moles, pound moles, ton moles, any mass measurement you want, you can use that mass measurement with the, mol the molar concept. So for example, if we say uh, carbon has a molecular weight of 12, one pound mole of carbon is 12 pounds. Well, 12 grams is way less carbon than 12 pounds, right? Or it could be a ton. Uh, it could be a ton mole. So a ton mole of carbon is 12 tons. Well, you know, 12 tons is a lot bigger stack of coal than 12 pounds, which is a lot bigger stack of coal than 12 grams. So they can't all have the same number of particles in them. Uh, that's obvious. And so the Avogadro's number applies to the gram moles. Uh, and of course, the CO2, I'm just uh, showing you uh, the molecular weight it would be carbon plus an O2, which in round numbers would be 44. Okay, now we get reference to table two over here in B and W. So let's take a look at this. These are just common chemical reactions uh, for combustion and you know, but the good news is we don't do anything very complicated in terms of the chemistry in here. Um, and so you see um, the, the top one is um, if you take two carbons plus an O2, you can get two COs, which you really don't want to do. That's what incomplete combustion because if you look at the, uh, the, the heat of combustion over here on the right, you only get 3950 uh, BTUs per pound. Uh, carbon released. Well, that's not good because if I burn one uh, one mole of carbon to completion with 102, I get 14 over 14,000 BTUs per pound. So anytime we have CO in our flue gases, that indicates a loss of energy because that there. I mean, CO is a low grade fuel. You know, you can burn CO and get energy out of it, obviously. Okay, and so you just see, and this is the molar uh, number of moles that combine. We're saying two carbon plus one O2 goes to two COs, which it's all pretty obvious. And these are the uh, masses. So that would be, since carbon is 12, two times 12 is 24, 102 is 32, and so this would be 56 going up the stack. So pretty nice table. Okay, uh, let's see, molar evaluations of combustion. Usually uh, when we get an analysis back on a gaseous fuel, uh, it's given on a volume basis. Uh, if we get an analysis back on a solid fuel like coal, it's usually given on a mass basis. So we need to be comfortable with switching back and forth from uh, uh, a percent volume basis to a percent mass basis or from percent mass to percent volume. We gotta be able to go back and forth. So this just shows a typical uh, natural gas. This one has what 85.3% methane, 12.6% ethane, and then we got some trace gases, CO, nitrogen, and oxygen. So we get 100%. Okay, and that's by volume, and by volume is also, uh, that would be the mole fractions, or that would be the molar percentages as well as the volume percentages. For an ideal gas, they're the same thing. Um, and we're not going to get up to pressures high enough that you have to worry about the uh, molecular interaction between the molecules. So we can assume ideal gas here, and there's no problem with that. Okay, so let's, and so this is some more on that same theme. Uh, mole fraction of a component 
in a mixture is equal to the moles of the component divided by the total moles. So that's just what we mean by mole fraction. So if half of them, if half of the moles in the container are oxygen and the other half are nitrogen, then the, uh, the molar fraction is 50% each. Okay. Uh, volume fraction of a component in a mixture for an ideal gas is the volume of the component divided by the volume of the mixture. Now, this is the whole partial volume concept. And so that's if, you, you, let's say you had a container uh, full of air and we're saying air is binary with oxygen and N2A, okay? If you could automatically whistle or somehow tap the container with your magic wand and you keep the pressure and temperature the same, but the gases segregate and all the oxygens run to one side of the container and all the N2A runs to the other side of the container, then what volume of the container is made up of, say, oxygen divided by the total volume of the container? And so that is what we mean by the volume fraction. Now, you can't do that. Uh, you can't make that happen. Once they're mixed, that's irreversible, but nonetheless, that's the concept. So in combustion, we rely and we make use of that partial volume concept as well as the partial pressure concept. Uh, and the partial pressure concept is if you have a container and it's full of, say, it's, it's air with uh, N2A and oxygen, uh, it's all spread out in the container. And so that container has a total pressure, which is the result of all of the, the molecules banging into the side of the container. Well, what portion of that pressure is caused by the oxygen? Well, it just depends on how many oxygen molecules are in there uh, compared to how many uh, N2A molecules are in there. So if they're 50-50 on a particle count, then the partial pressure would be half oxygen and half N2A. If it's so it, say it's 80% N2A and 20% oxygen, then the partial pressure of the oxygen would be 20% of the total and of the N2A would be 80%. So, you know, you, you need to be clear on the concepts of uh, partial pressure versus partial volume. Okay, and so for this little derivation, we're uh, relying on the partial volume concept. So what we can do is we can write the ideal gas law as we do here in the, 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 the top uh, version of it uh, for one component, we just call it component one, which could be oxygen or whatever you want. So it's, uh, the, and, and the pressure is the same because that's the concept of partial volume. We have the same pressure temperature. We just have these molecules magically sequestered on different sides of the container. So the pressure is gonna be the same. Then this would be the volume that's occupied by component one times the number of moles component one, and this is universal gas constant and temperature. Okay, and then we divide that by the ideal gas equation for the mixture. So this is, again, the same P, it's gonna cancel out. This is the total volume of the mixture of the container. This is total number of moles in the container, and this is our universal gas constant and same temperature. So all of this boils down to this, and so what we see is that for this ideal gas, that the volume fraction is equal to the molar fraction. That's what that's all about. I don't know if it's worth doing it or not, but you did it. Okay, so let's move on. And, and so um, this, this is the same gas and, and you know it was tested and reported to us on a volume basis, but now we know, so, as long as it's an ideal gas, that this is also the same as the molar percent in the container. So 100% of the gas, 85.3% of the moles are uh, methane, ethane, et cetera. Okay, so now we wanna break this down uh, and figure out how much we have the different um, uh, elements of this gas. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna do these calculations. So we look at the elemental breakdown. So this would be moles of species like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, per 100 moles of fuel, okay? So the carbon, we have some carbon in CH4. So we have 85.3 moles 
of methane and each one of those has one mole of carbon so times one is 85.3 moles of carbon in the methane okay in the ethane uh, we have 12.6 moles but each one of those has two moles of carbon so we multiply it by two and we get 25.2 and then we also have some co2 uh, we just have 0.1 moles and so that's a one-to-one -one ratio so we get uh, 0.1 i add that up and so i've got uh, 110.6 moles of carbon and see we have to break it out like this to do the combustion analysis because the carbon burns and then the hydrogen burns and then the sulfur burns if it's there etc Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing for the hydrogen. Um, and we're gonna count H2s, but in uh, methane, it's H4. So we've got 85.3 uh, H4s. And so I gotta multiply by two to get the number of H2s. So that's 170.6. And in ethane, it's H6. And I've got 12.6, so I got to multiply by three to get the number of H2s. And so that's 37.8. So I total that up, and I've got 208.4. Uh, oxygen, uh, we've got what? We got CO2, and we've got some O2. And so it's one to one uh, in both of these. So we simply add that up. And so the fuel is going to per 100 moles, we're going to contribute 0.4 moles of oxygen to the combustion process. Uh, and total nitrogen is just, was just stated at uh, 1.7, okay? So then uh, using table one, the combustion constants, it would be, uh, we can easily determine the, how much oxygen we need stoichiometrically to burn this. Uh, as well as how much air or how much N2A that we have to bring in uh, and what the products of combustion would be, assuming complete, perfect combustion, okay? So, and I haven't done that here, but, but you could do that as an exercise. Uh, convert, so now we want to convert from uh, moles of elements to per 100 moles of fuel to pounds per hundred pounds of gas. So we want to be able to translate back and forth from the, the volume or molar world into the, the weight or mass world. And this is, this is how we do it. Uh, pretty simple, just use the molecular weight. That's, your, that's what transforms us back and forth. So uh, we look at carbon, uh, we had 110.6 moles per hundred moles of fuel. And so if we uh, state the molecular weight, 12.011 for the steam book, uh, and that's pounds per pound mole. And so I just uh, multiply. And so this will give me pounds per 100 moles of fuel. So this uh, 110.6 moles per 100 moles of fuel times 12.011 is equal to 1328.4 pounds of carbon per 100 moles of fuel, okay? And I'm gonna do that for all the other constituents here. So I've got the hydrogen, multiply by molecular weight, oxygen, nitrogen, and add all of that up. Now this is, this is uh, elemental nitrogen because it's not reported, that's N2, not N2A, that's bound up in the fuel or that comes into the fuel. It's reported as nitrogen in this case. So we use the nitrogen molecular weight, not that it would make much difference. Uh, if we use the N2A, it would be a very small difference. Anyway, so we multiply that and then we add all of this up. And so we know that 100 moles of this fuel is gonna weigh 1,808.9 pounds. And then, so if that's the total, then I take each uh, component, the weight of each one, for example, carbon, 1328.4 uh, divided by 1808.9 times 100 to get a percent. So on a mass basis, um, it's 73.5% uh, carbon, 23.2% hydrogen, 0.7% oxygen, and 2.6% nitrogen. 
of the hundred. And so you can either say that's a hundred, or you could say that this represents a hundred pounds of fuel. And this would be, if this was a hundred pounds of fuel, then 73.5 pounds of it would be carbon. So you know, there's different ways to interpret whether it's a percent or whether it's pounds per hundred pounds. This is what the steam book likes to do. So that's why we, we kind of talk in those terms. Uh, and again, this 1808.9 is pounds mass of fuel per hundred moles of fuel. And if you work these problems, it's good to uh, go ahead and write out these units in detail. Okay, on to page four, this is just a conversion. I don't know why I wrote that up there. At some point, I guess I wanted it, but uh, anyway. Okay, ultimate analysis is determined on a percent mass basis. Okay, what is ultimate analysis? Well, I've got, so you won't have to listen to me drone the whole time. Uh, and I'm gonna send you this link. Um, and I'll let you listen to it. I'll play a little bit of it here and then I'll probably cut it off and uh, let you listen to it. And it's only about 10 minutes, so it's not a big deal. You are going to determine the elements like carbon and hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Also, you are going to see significance of ultimate analysis. Let us see one by one. So determination of carbon and hydrogen. As you know, when carbon is burned, it can be converted into the oxide, that is carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Also hydrogen is converted into the water. So for this practical, we are going to take a pre-weighed coal sample, which is burned in presence of pure oxygen in the apparatus shown below. So this is the apparatus. So in this apparatus, we are using different parts. That is, uh, this is the long cylindrical tube. This is called as combustion tube. A sample is placed in this platinum boat. Then it is a burner, which will provide heat to the coal sample. Also, we are providing the pure and dry oxygen, which supports burning. And here is a filter, which is, uh, this uh, filter is cuprous oxide filter or the pellets. And then only carbon dioxide and H2O is passed through this tube. So these are the two U-shaped tubes. You can say they are the U-tubes. So this is the first U-tube in which pre and anhydrous calcium chloride is placed. And in second U-tube, there is a KOH solution, which is again pre weighed KOH solution. So whatever the excess of oxygen is there, that can be removed from the last step of this U-tube. So what happens when calcium chloride is there, first, this calcium chloride absorbs the water molecule. Okay, um, I think that's enough of that. Uh, I, I want you to watch it and just get some kind of an idea what an ultimate analysis is and uh, how they go about determining all of those things. Okay, but uh, it's typically on a mass basis. So then we need to be able to convert to a molar basis and we do that instead of multiplying by the molecular weight when we were in a volume to go to mass. Now we divide by the molecular weight. Um, so let's see, if we have uh, the uh, pound of constituent per 100 pounds of fuel, we divide by the pounds of constituent per mole and say, so pounds of constituent, you know, whether that carbon or hydrogen, whatever, will cancel, and we'll get moles of, say, carbon per 100 pounds of fuel. And so then you're in the world of uh, moles instead of uh, mass. Okay, and so I'm referred to table three. Okay, so let's make this a little smaller and continue. Okay. 
So this is what you get back from an ultimate analysis, okay? So we took our sample, and of course, when you sample a coal pile, I think I'll send you a link. I, I, I think there's a YouTube video on how to sample a coal pile. There is an ASTM sa uh, standard on the proper way to s take a sample from a coal pile. And that's how that's how detailed some of the stuff is to make sure that to hopefully you get a represent that the test result comes back as really representative of um, the overall pile. Now, how well that works, I don't know, but anyway, there is there is such a standard. Um, so we sent our uh, sample off to the lab. They ground it up and came back, and they say it's seventy two percent by weight uh, carbon. Uh, hydrogen is 4.4, sulfur is 1.6, low sulfur coal, that's a, that's a pretty good sulfur number. Oxygen, 3.6, uh, nitrogen, and that would be uh, elemental nitrogen, not atmospheric, 1.4, and water, 8%, uh, and ash, 9% total for 100%. So on a wet basis, uh, it's the, that's the percent breakdown. Or you could say, uh, if I had uh, 100 pounds of fuel, I would have 72 pounds of carbon. That's kind of the way this the steam work likes to interpret this thing. So anyway, uh, column three, we just state the molecular weight, and then we simply divide. So molecular weight, 72 divided by 12.011, says there's 5.995 moles of carbon per 100 pounds of fuel. And it, again, it's best to write these units out in detail to uh, keep yourself straight. Uh, so you just go down and do the uh, division. Uh, and, and so you get uh, column four. <coughs> and we told that now, uh, let's see, they drop the ash out because the ash just doesn't participate. Uh, it may actually carry, it becomes a loss on the boiler because it usually leaves it a uh, higher temperature than it comes in. Uh, but nonetheless, it drops out of the combustion uh, analysis. So we just uh, forget about the ash. We total up, and so we get 8.835 moles of constituents per 100 pounds of fuel. And we remember that we you know, threw out uh, the... Uh, uh, the nine pounds of ash. Okay, and then we, we look at the reactions and we say, okay, so what's our combustion product if we burn this properly? Now, of course, we can have partial combustion and all that. That's another level down. Uh, but so we say we're going to burn the carbon to CO2 and we're going to burn the uh, hydrogen to water, probably water vapor, the sulfur to SO2. The oxygen is going to contribute. It's going to come out in one of these other species. Uh, nitrogen just goes up the stack, <clears throat> and then the water just goes up the stack, okay? Then column six says, okay, uh, how many moles uh, for stoichiometric combustion, theoretical combustion, how many moles of O2 do I have to supply this? And so we look at the, the, the ratio, we get one O2 for one carbon, and so I need 5.995 moles of O2 to burn 5.995 moles of carbon, okay? On um, the water vapor, since it comes out as an O and I'm counting O2s, then I take the number of moles of H2 and divide by two, and I get 1.091 uh, moles of O2 required to burn 2.183 moles of hydrogen, H2. Uh, the sulfur dioxide is one to one, just like the uh, carbon. And so I've got 0.05 moles of sulfur per 100 moles of fuel. So that's 0.05 moles of O2. Uh, I get a credit. And so the parentheses over here represent a negative because that's already supplied in the reaction and I don't have to bring in extra air for that and nitrogen goes through unaffected and water vapor goes through unaffected. So when I add this up, it says that I'm going to have to provide 7.023 moles of O2 for 
complete theoretical stoichiometric combustion of this particular coal. Okay. All right. Let's go back here to the notes. Okay. So it says uh, when a fuel contains oxygen, I just said this, the, the amount of theoretical O2 needed for combustion is reduced as we just showed in that example. Okay. So let's look at uh, composition of air, the U S standard atmosphere. Uh, I think still has this definition. So oxygen is 0 0.20947 would be the fraction um, of moles per mole of dry air or for an ideal gas that would be on a volume basis as well, partial volume. And you see the N2, argon and CO2. CO2 may have gone up a little bit. I don't know. I don't know if they've restated it lately or not. This, this uh, number may be, may require updating. Anyway, the, so the average molecular weight of dry air is 28.966. Sometimes you see 965. 28.97, pretty good number. Whatever. <clears throat> okay, and then now we've caught up in the notes to the N2A to simplify calculations N2 is considered to include argon plus other trace elements. That's called atmospheric nitrogen N2A. And the molecular weight there is 28.161. And again, just elemental nitrogen, the molecular weight is 28.013. Uh, notice air contains some moisture. As uh, standard practice, the American Boiler Manufacturers Association, which is ABMA, considers moisture content to be 0.013 pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. That's kind of just a standard number. If you don't know, if you don't have any kind of a measurement and you're doing some sort of a calculation and you need to know how much water vapor is coming in with a combustion air, that's your standard number. Now, obviously in the summertime when it's hot and humid, it's more. In the wintertime when it's cold and dry, it's less. Anyway, that's what they recommend. If you don't know, it's much better to take a measurement. Okay. Uh, but they say, and so that's 60% relative humidity at 80 degrees dry bulb. So if I go to a site chart, so 60% 80 degrees. Now if I go, uh, let's see, go up just a little. Is that right? I can't remember anything. Yeah, 80. Okay. So 80 degrees right down here, dry bulb, up to 60. If I can keep this straight, it's about right here. That's 60%, 80. And if I come across, it's just slightly above 0 0.01. Three. That's 0 0.012, and that's pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air. There's 0 0.014, and so there's 0 0.013 right there on the site chart. And this is a sea level or atmospheric pressure site chart. Okay. Um, so for combustion calculations, we typically are working on a molar basis. So what you have to do is you have to multiply the number if you're working in US, if you, if, you, if you have pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air, if you want to convert to a molar basis, you multiply it by 1.608. And then the standard number becomes 0 0.0209 moles of water vapor per mole of dry air. And this just shows the, um, the units on this. So it's just the, that's just the ratio of the molecular weights. It's all that uh, molecular weight of dry air divided by the molecular weight of water. So and there's the units and all that sort of thing. So um, let's say that, oh, I could give you a problem. Usually I, I make you go to a site chart if I'm going to give a a problem, I might say, oh, maybe it's really severe. I'd say it's 100 degrees, and let's say it's it's 50% uh, relative humidity at 100 degrees. So there's a 100 degree line. Uh, 
that's 50. Oh, that's a good one. It's right on the line. That's 50 and 100. I read across. So that's 0 0.021. There's 0 0.022, 0 0.020, so there's 0 0.021. Okay, let me get that in the calculator. 0 0.021 times, what did I say? That, that conversion factor is uh, times 1.608. So that becomes 0 0.03377 pound or moles of water vapor per mole of dry air. So that's all. That's all you really have to do. Okay, let's see. So we want to go, looks like uh, table three we've already looked at. Uh, this is table four. I never did uh, make a copy of it because it's so small. This is just kind of the, the, the engineer's interpretation of the composition of dry air. So on a percent volume basis, we say uh, dry air is 20.95% oxygen and 79.05% N2A. If you want to do it on a percent by weight, if you had say 100 pounds, of this air, 23.14 uh, pounds of it would be oxygen, and the other 76.86 pounds would be uh, N2A. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, moisture content of air is normally determined from uh, wet bulb, dry bulb, and relative humidity data using a psych chart. So we can look over here. Um, these are the dry bulb temperature lines. These are the wet bulb temperature. So if you have a sling psychrometer or something, you can measure wet bulb. Let's say if the wet bulb was 65 and the dry bulb was 95, then the relative humidity would be a little under 20%, and this would be the moisture content. Or if you measured relative humidity, then you pick whatever line and you come up on your dry bulb temperature. Okay, uh, moisture in air, uh, humidity ratio, which again is this critter over here, humidity ratio, pounds of water per pound of dry air, can be calculated from this, where um, this is the uh, ratio, of, this is this same ratio, it's just inverted. If I take the water on top and the air on the bottom, I get point uh, six, actually it's 6219 if you want better accuracy, but <clears throat> the steam book rounds it to 0.622. And it's times the vapor pressure of water vapor in the air divided by the barometric pressure, the total pressure minus the vapor pressure, or this is the pressure of the uh, uh, N2A because that's all, that's all we have. Uh, for uh, dry air, we just have uh, N2A plus vapor equals barometric. Okay, so uh, you can you can use this. You have to figure out the vapor pressure, and so one way to do that, if you know the relative humidity, uh, you can take the relative humidity and that would assumes it's in a percent. That's what the 0.014 is like to divide by 100 times the uh, vapor pressure uh, at saturation at that temperature. So what you can do is you can go to the steam table at your dry bulb temperature and look up your saturation water vapor pressure times the relative humidity divided by 100, and that'll give you an estimate of the water vapor pressure. And then you can plug it in here and get your humidity ratio. Or there is this, uh, I've never really used this carrier equation, but it's been out there a long time. I think it's pretty good. Uh, you can uh, plug into uh, this thing uh, if you want to, and to get the vapor pressure. So anyway, frequently used uh, constants, uh, the moles of air, how many, how many moles of air do you have to bring in? To get a mole of oxygen, and so you can take uh, it, you can uh, take 100 divided by 20.95 because that's the percent of oxygen in 
dry air and it comes out 4.77327. So that's the number. So if I need a mole of oxygen, I have to bring in 4.77327 moles of dry air to get it. Okay. And, or you can do it on a, a cubic foot basis since this is an ideal gas and it's exactly the same ratio we're showing here is equate at uh, constant or uh, two. Um, the moles of N2A uh, that you have to bring in to get a mole of O2, you can take 79.05 divided by 20.95 and it's 3.77327. So you add the one mole of oxygen to that and you get the 4.77327 that was the total that I brought in. Uh, if you do this on a mass basis, then um, you need to uh, bring in uh, 4.32152 uh, pounds of dry air to get a pound of O2. Likewise, the same, same thing for the N2A. Okay. Let's see. Okay, calculations in table two uh, can be converted. Well, I'm forgetting. I gotta I gotta go back. I forget what table two is. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Here. Very good. Uh, calculation table two can be converted to combustion with air rather than oxygen. Okay by adding 3.77327 really moles of N2A per mole of O2, left and right hand side. So, you know, uh, in that equation, they just showed you the oxygen. They didn't show you the uh, N2A, but it's easy enough to do. So this was our equation. So we just add, to get one of these, we gotta add this. Uh, so that's pretty easy. So for methane. I don't think you're having trouble with that. Okay, theoretical air requirement. Minimum air required for complete combustion of fuel uh, is theoretical or stoichiometric. Small amounts of uh, SO3, SO2, whatever, NOx, uh, unburned hydrocarbons and other minor species are typically formed. Uh, must use more than theoretical air to assure complete combustion. So that means that we're going to put in some excess air. Uh, for example, um, in table three, consider completing the combustion calculations on a molar basis using 20% excess air. So we're going to jump to this table five. And that's what they've done is they've just uh, increased the amount of uh, air into a and uh, oxygen by 20% in order to make sure that we have enough to get complete combustion of the fuel. So let's come down here. So this was uh, stoichiometric or just theoretical air. And now, oops, uh, let's rotate, get this puppy around, make it maybe a little smaller. Okay. So uh, they pulled uh, these numbers off of uh, table three. And so you can go back and check, but so the, uh, the, the amount of theoretical O2 that we needed from table three was 7.023 moles of O2 per hundred pounds of fuel that we're gonna burn, okay? So this is just the, uh, the percent of oxygen <clears throat> uh, in standard air, it's 20.95%. So you can either dividing by this is multiplying by 4.77327. So they're gonna show it by dividing. So if I take this and divide by this, that says that I have to have 33.523 moles of dry combustion air per 100 pounds of fuel. That's just for stoichiometric, 
this amount of air produce, brings in this amount of O2, and that's exactly what I needed for combustion. Okay, so now we're going to assume we're bringing in 20% excess air. So I take 20% of the 33.523 and I get 6.705 uh, moles of additional air. That's got oxygen in it and N2A, but I'm going to bring in another 6.705 in order to have some extra around. And then so my total dry combustion air is the sum of this plus this is 40.228. So that's the amount of air that I'm gonna bring in per 100 pounds of fuel that I'm going to combust, okay? Uh, now, this is the amount of moisture. This is my standard number. <clears throat> that's the 0.013 times the 1.608 or 609 to convert the units to a molar basis. So that's just my standard number. And then I'm gonna multiply uh, my total amount of air that comes in times the amount of moisture that's in it. And remember this is, um, uh, this is moles of moisture per mole of dry air. And this is moles of dry air. So when I multiply those, <clears throat> I get the amount of water uh, vapor that comes in with the combustion air and it's 0 0.841 moles of H2O in this 40 moles of combustion air. Okay, so then this is the uh, volume fraction of N2A in standard air. Standard air is uh, dry air is 79.05% uh, into A, and so I'm going to take line three. Now this is my stoichiometric air, and I'm going to multiply it by 79.05, and that says that um, the N2A in the dry theoretical air is uh, 26 and a half moles per 100 pounds of fuel, and then I've got some more N2A in this excess air that I'm bringing in, uh, I'm bringing in this, and so that would be line four. And again, it's times this seven, uh, the 79.7905, and that is another 5.3 moles of N2A. And so if I total those, I get 31.8. He didn't put that in the table, but I put that off to the side over here. So that's how much N2A. And then O2. I've got O2 left, right? Because I brought in extra, not that I needed it. The only reason I needed it is because I didn't have perfect mixing and I didn't, I wanted to be assured that I had an O2 every place I needed an O2. And so uh, I'm gonna take my line two up here, which is that's the amount of oxygen in air. And I'm gonna multiply it times line four, which is the amount of excess air, this is, total excess air brought in. And when I do that, I'm gonna see I get 1.405 moles of O2 that are left, not combusted, to go up the stack, okay? So that's pretty much it on this one. Uh, just some notes down here. I think we talked through all of that, so, okay. Now let's go back, see what, the, the notes say here. <clears throat> now consider the portion of the combustion products attributable to air. The oxygen in the theoretical air is already accounted for uh, in the products of combustion in those particular forms. So this leaves into a in the theoretical air, into A in the excess air, O2 in the excess air, and water in the air as calculated in table five. As the products uh, in the combustion gas attributable to the wet combustion air. Uh, these constituents are in addition to the combustion products from the fuel shown in table three. Okay, so now we're going to go to table six. And 
we'll finish this and then I think I'll cap this one off. It's a little crooked, but that's okay. Okay, so calculation of flue gas and air quantities on a mass basis. Okay, so now we want to get to uh, pounds of water vapor and pounds of CO2 and stuff going up the stack. Okay, so from uh, table five, we're going to bring over some of these quantities and let's look over this. Notice uh, the units are moles of whatever the constituent is, excuse me, per 100 pounds of fuel. So the CO2 was 5.995, and the SO2 was 0.05, and then we had N2. Now this is elemental nitrogen, which was in the fuel, bound up in the fuel, 0.05. As we know, that can contribute to NOx. Uh, and then we have N2A, which is uh, from the uh, combustion air that was brought in. And that totaled the 31.8. And we had 26.5 from the theoretical air and 5.3 from the excess air. That just shows where that comes from. And then in the oxygen, we had 1.405 moles of oxygen left over. That's the 20% uh, that goes up the stack per every 100 pounds of fuel that we burn, okay? So if we total up these things, we get 39.3 uh, moles of uh, dry combustion products per every 100 pounds of fuel that we combust, okay? Now, we, got, we want to uh, add up the water that's going up the stack. Well, so from the combustion of the hydrogen, the H2, we produce 2.183 moles of H2O vapor uh, per 100 pounds of fuel. Then in the fuel that just came in, it came 0.444 moles per 100 pounds of fuel. And then uh, in the air, we brought in another 0.841 moles per 100 pounds of fuel. So if we just add those three numbers up, we get 3.468, and that's moles of water vapor up the stack per 100 pounds of fuel. And I'm assuming nothing's condensing. Okay, so my total wet products then would be the sum, it's the 39.3 plus the 3.468, and we get um, 42.768. So that's the uh, total weight of the wet combustion products. So we can talk about dry products, we can talk about wet products. And then the dry air, uh, that we brought in, uh, we brought in um, 40.228 moles, I believe that's right, let me get that, yeah, right here, 40.228, and then uh, in the water, and he has a typo, uh, there was a typo on the slide, so I changed that here, because for that water, it's just, uh, it's this number right here, so it should be uh, eight, 0.841, so that's 0.841. So then uh, that's the, those are the total uh, moles that are coming in per 100 pounds of fuel uh, in the combustion air, dry air plus water vapor, okay? So now let's start converting. <clears throat> we're gonna go, uh, let me see, I guess we're gonna calculate some percents on the volume basis and then we'll go to the uh, mass analysis. Okay, so if we want the uh, percent volume dry, remember that's a molar percent, so then we simply, uh, this is all my dry components here, and this is the total, so um, I take the five, 0.995 divided by 39.3. Let me check that with my calculator, but I'm just 100%. 5.995 divided by 
15.25 exactly. So he just taking each one of these and dividing by this total and multiplying by 100. So that then that adds to 100. So this is the uh, flue gas analysis on a dry basis. Then I'm going to do it on a wet basis. And so now this is my total wet products of combustion. So now um, I have to take all of these and divide by 42.768. And I also have to divide the water value. And so I now, you know, that reduces the percent because the water's in there. So now uh, my CO2 is down to 14.02, et cetera. N2A is uh, 74.35 and et cetera. Water is 8.11%. Uh, now I total those up and I get 100% right here. Now I'm going to use the molecular weights because uh, I have moles over here. And so all I got to do is multiply the moles times the molecular weight and I get the pounds of constituent per 100 pounds of fuel combusted. And so that's what I'm doing, 5.995 times 44.01 should be 263.8. And I just carry that down, add all this up. Uh, so for, as far as my dry products are concerned, to burn 100 pounds of fuel, I'm gonna put 1208.9 pounds of dry gas up the stack and this will be the breakdown of it. Uh, if I want to add the water vapor, I've got another 62 and a half pounds of water vapor going up the stack. So that makes the total uh, 1271.4. And then I can calculate percents. He doesn't carry that out. But so, you know, I, if I want the dry mass percent, I take each one of these and divide by this. If I want the wet ones, I take each one of these plus this one, divide them individually by this and cast those as a percent. Um, and then down at the bottom on the air, he's gonna translate um, to, instead of moles, to uh, pounds. And so this is the molecular weight of uh, dry air times the 40.228 is 1165.1 pounds of dry air. Uh, in the combustion process per 100 pounds of fuel. And here's the water, 15.2 uh, is what comes in with it. And the total weight of that is 1180.5. That's good. It's uh, pretty straightforward, but uh, there's a, uh, you know, a number of calculations involved in getting here. So I think I'm going to stop this right now. I think this has probably gone on maybe even a little longer than I typically do. So I'll get this posted. Um, and I'm going to send you another uh, video link. Uh, I'll send you two other video links uh, to watch as well. So I hope you guys are having a great day and staying safe. I'll be back in touch. Thanks.